Martin, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all. This evening, I'd like to thank uh, Prone and the Western Front Association for the invitation uh, to speak to you. It seems a little odd uh, speaking to an Ulster audience sitting from my front room in Canterbury, but uh, these are the times in which we, we live. Uh, what I thought I'd do this evening is start off by giving you a brief overview of Claude Auchinleck's uh, army career. And then I'll tackle the question that Ian has raised about the Ulster connections. Uh, Oakenlex often claimed as one of the Ulster uh, field marshals. The links are a little more tenuous than that. Uh, Sobriquet perhaps suggests. So I'll do that and then I'll move on to talk about some specific aspects of the British Indian Army. So I'll talk about uh, the recruitment system, um, particularly the so-called Marshall races, and how that changes over the period that Auchinleck uh, involved with the Indian Army. I'll talk about the officer corps, which is increasingly Indianized uh, as the, the time goes on. I'll talk about the expeditionary capability of the Indian Army. In other words, what was it for and what, what could it actually provide uh, in the two world wars? And finally, I'll say a little bit about the Indian Army and the partition uh, of India. So if I, I start off with Auchinleck's career, uh, he gets his first commission in the Indian Army in 1904 uh, as a second lieutenant and retires from the Indian Army as commander in chief uh, in 1947. So uh, that gives you an idea of the parameters that, that I'm looking at this evening. And the reasons for Auchinleck to go into the Indian Army are largely, it seems, down to family finances. He was from what could be seen as a traditional army family. His father was a colonel in the Royal Artillery, but his father died quite soon after Auchinleck was born and left the family in more or less a genteel poverty. So Auchinleck could go to Wellington College, uh, an elite independent school because they did a special deal for the sons of army officers who had died uh, in, in straitened circumstances. So his family had to pay, I think it was £10 a year for him to attend uh, Wellington, obviously worth a lot more money then uh, than today, but something in the region of sort of £2,000 rather than the rather eye-watering £42,000 that you would spend uh, to send uh, one of your children to Wellington these days. Uh, so the Indian Army system meant that Auchinleck, once he got into the Indian Army, could actually live on his salary. Uh, a junior officer in the British Army would have to have a private income of about £100 a year, maybe 20000 in today's money, uh, to pay their mass bills, to pay for uniforms, to pay for horses. Uh, an officer in the Indian Army, junior officer, could make the books balance really from the start. Uh, so that's the, the incentive um, getting into uh, the Indian Army is then very competitive. Having said all that, Auchinleck doesn't do terribly well in the entrance exams for uh, the Royal Military College at Sandhurst. He gets in somewhere, it seems, in the mid-30s out of about 240 cadets that went in in his year. But saying all that, we should reflect that Auchinleck managed that when he was effectively 17 and a half years old, and he did it without a crammer. So a lot of other uh, well-known officers, Winston Churchill's one that springs to mind, uh, paid out uh, quite a lot of money to specialist crammers and often had to try two or three times to get into Sandhurst, whereas Auchinleck managed to first off comparatively young and without any great uh, sort of specialist tuition. So I think that that says something about him. He seems to have dropped a fair number of places at Sandhurst, um, passed out somewhere in the 80s, it seems, um, didn't seem to particularly enjoy his time at Sandhurst, but it was an awkward time in the history of that institution. Uh, there were, were a lot of disciplinary problems in his year. No particular sense that he was involved in them, but uh, it seems to have left a fairly uh, bad legacy. As was normal then, Auchinleck uh, went out to India on the unattached list. So when officers passed out of Sandhurst, they were put on the unattached list. 
with a view that they would join an Indian Army regiment once they got out to India, did a secondment with a British Army regiment and learned some of the local languages. They, the standard of language instruction at Sandhurst would seem to be pretty poor. And depending on what regiment they went to, they would need to pick up other command languages anyway. So there's a period of about a year when Auchinleck is serving with the 2nd King's Own Shropshire Light Infantry uh, in India and works out what regiment to join. Now, it seems that as early as on the boat over, he had been approached by an adjutant of a Gurkha regiment who had been told to seek him out because his colonel was one of Auchinleck's father's old friends. And it seems that family connections and an Ulster connection meant that Auchinleck was offered a place in the 2nd 5th Gurkha Rifles but Auchinleck actually decides to opt for the 62nd Punjabi Regiment uh, when he gets the choice and goes for them in April 1904. Now, the commanding officer of the Punjabi Regiment was uh, Colonel Rainey Robinson, originally from County Down. So again, there's some sort of Ulster connection going on there, perhaps. Uh, there's also the point that the uniform of the 62nd Punjabis would have been a lot cheaper than the fairly elegant rifle uniform of the Gurkhas, and, and finance was, was an important issue for uh, Auchinleck, at, certainly in those early years of his uh, career. And despite their relatively low number, or high number, sorry, 62nd, sounds as if this is a you know, fairly recently raised regiment. They could actually claim to be one of the oldest regiments in the Indian Army, and later they're renamed as the, the first Punjabis in the 1921 reform. So it's actually a more prestigious uh, infantry regiment in, in sort of social pecking order, army list terms, uh, that, that it perhaps first appears. To give you an idea then of the responsibility Auchinleck has, in 1906, age 23, he finds himself in command of a company of his regiment based in Tibet, 100 miles from his regimental headquarters and in personal command. So this shows you the uh, amount of autonomy and authority that's given to Indian Army officers quite early on in their career. This is at a time when an equivalent officer in the British Army could expect to be commanding a, a half company under very close supervision from uh, a captain and major. Ian said a bit about the, the sort of First World War experience. I'll not labour this too much, um, and I should indeed start to show you a few slides, but. That shows you uh, Auchinleck, you can see him there at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the back right, uh, with the officers of the 62nd Punjabis. When war breaks out, the regiment um, is earmarked to be the third contingent to be sent overseas and is originally earmarked to go to France to reinforce the Indian Corps that's there. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen the, the fine Indian Army Memorial at New Chapelle, um, where the, the two divisions, uh, two infantry divisions, take very heavy losses in 1914-1915. They are diverted when the Ottoman Empire enters the war, and originally his battalion is one of those that's sent to the Suez Canal to defend that from a Turkish invasion where they, they perform uh, perfectly successfully. At that stage, Auchinleck is in charge of the um, two machine guns that the battalion has, and by all accounts, sights them uh, very effectively, and they, they manage to, to hold that section of the Suez uh, Canal without great difficulty. Soon after that, though, they're moved to Mesopotamia, the particularly grim campaign that's fought out there to try and relieve Cut. And there, Auchinleck sees the horrors of a, a full frontal attack. This is you know, not far off what we think of as Western Front uh, style, where his regiment loses 372 casualties, 30 of them killed outright. Uh, so that's a pretty grim experience. He was later in interviews to speak of that as absolute murder and to speak of the stupidity of the general officer commanding. And this is simply a frontal attack when he thought that an outflanking uh, maneuver could have been carried out. Um, for a period then, uh, Auchinleck was acting commanding officer of his own battalion. And he then held a number of staff posts, a brigade major and then general staff officer, grade one, grade two, in uh, 
what's effectively the Indian Army of Occupation in the Ottoman Empire in 1918-1919. So while he didn't finish the First World War with a particularly high rank, he ends up having had battalion command experience and fulfilled some very difficult staff posts. So that, that seems to have done something to, to mark him out. But having said all that, and I should say that uh, Claude Auchinleck doesn't die until 1981, so his service record isn't released yet, and we needn't expect it to be released uh, until some point in the 2050s, uh, the way things are, are going. Um, so it's a little difficult to work out when he is sort of marked out for, for high command. And I'll give you a flavour of this as to what happens in the, the early 20s. Um, because the, there's times on looks of his career as being accelerated and moved on and others where it looks as if he's jumping back. So it's a little hard to work out uh, what exactly is going on there. So he sent to the Indian Staff College at Quetta in 1919. So that's seen as a, as a good thing if you want to become a high commander in the British or Indian armies. You generally have, have gone to Staff College, so that, that's important. And then once he completes that course, he goes to Indian Army Headquarters as Deputy Assistant Quartermaster General at Simla. So that's moving with you know, all the big names in the, the Indian Army. So, so far, so good. But then in 1923, he's returned to his regiment as second in command. This is when they've been re, uh, formed and renamed as the first, first Punjabis. But he soon finds himself working as General Staff Officer Grade 2 to Robert Cassells, who was then a divisional commander. And Cassells goes on to be Commander-in-Chief of the Indian Army, and indeed Auchinleck is to succeed Cassells as Commander-in-Chief. So it might be at this point that Cassells emerges as a patron, and that that becomes very important in Auchinleck's career. In 1927, Auchinleck is back in Britain on home leave. Indian Army officers got uh, essentially one year every four on home leave, where their, their passage home was um, back to India was paid for by the uh, Indian government. And he then attended the Imperial Defence College. And he later said that he was sent to this, which is effectively a higher staff course that's set up for those that are deemed to be the real high flyers in the British and uh, in Indian armies and in the RAF and in the Royal Navy and in the civil service. Uh, he says that he's sent in that because he was already home on home leave. So the Indian government didn't have to pay out any extra money uh, to send him back. That might be awkward, like sense of humour that led him to say that, uh, although there's perhaps just a grain of truth in that, uh, when you see the meanness of the Indian office. The Imperial Defence College is important, I think, in Auchinleck's career because it's there that he meets John Dill. John Dill is there as chief instructor and he meets Alan Brooke as a fellow student. Um, Dill and Brooke both go on to become chiefs of the Imperial General Staff. And I think Auchinleck can certainly be seen as a, a protege of John Dill, another Ulsterman, of course. So there's there perhaps something going on there. That also should then remove from our minds this idea that comes up in some of the writings about Auchinleck that you know he was a terrible outsider and didn't get on in the British Army in the, the Middle East in 1941-42 because people in the British Army didn't actually know him. Um, he, he does know a lot of senior figures in the, the uh, British Army from the 20s and is well known and well respected by them. He then goes back to India in 1928, goes to his own regiment, 1st 1st Punjabis as commanding officer. Sometimes he in later life reflect that was the happiest part of his service career when he was commanding his own, his own battalion and his own regiment and involved in recruiting activities and so on. Um, getting to meet a lot of uh, army pensioners, visiting uh, villages from where the men were recruited and so on. But he is fairly quickly then posted to the Staff College at Quetta as a full colonel and chief instructor to the junior division. So again, the importance of the Staff College and, and high command uh, is sort of emphasised by that point. He then gets an important brigade command. In 1933-35, he commands the Peshawar Brigade. 
And that's a very important appointment in the Indian Army because it's a much larger brigade than usual. It's five battalions rather than three. It has a cavalry component, it has an artillery component, uh, and indeed it even has an armoured component when he's commanding it. It has some vicars uh, like tanks with it. And he also then gets some action uh, against... uh, local tribesmen, Northwest Frontier stuff, uh, in which he uses uh, armour and is seen to, to perform very successfully. The officer that commands the brigade next to him, um, who he cooperates with very closely then, is Harold Alexander, another Ulsterman who's a future field marshal in the Second World War. So again, these important connections with British Army officers are, are forming. Between 1936 and 39, then, uh, Auchinleck goes to be Deputy Chief of the General Staff in India, and he advises the Chatfield Committee, uh, of which I'll say a little bit more shortly, on Indian Army reform. Then, uh, this is what I cover in, in Volume 1, uh, if you're not a member of the Army Record Society for a mere £25, uh, you can join and get uh, this book that I think Boydale Press has done a very good job uh, with, a nice uh, hardback book, lavishly uh, illustrated, good maps, all that type of thing. Uh, the Army Record Society does spoil you. Um, and quite an interesting uh picture off from there by, by Eves done in 1940. And in this period then, Auchinleck is an unusual position because it looks as if he's originally going to bring an Indian division to the Middle East. Uh, but he is then whisked away to command a corps of the British Army, a very unusual thing for an Indian Army officer to do then. He then finds himself in command in uh, a corps command and then a, a regional command in southern England uh, during the invasion, threat invasion scare of the summer of 1940. After that, he goes back to India briefly between January and May 1941 as commander in chief. And at that period, as commander in chief, he does have some. Uh, operational command responsibility as well over the Indian Army units that are in Iraq. Then he sent to the Middle East as Commander in Chief, June 1941 to August 1942. And depending on your point of view, um, he's then the man that, that halts Rommel and shows how the Africa Corps can be defeated, or he's another one of the serial losers that's just out there to show how brilliant General Montgomery is uh, when he's finally allowed to take command. Um, so degummed from the Middle East, um, he then has a period of what's essentially unemployment back in India. Um, he writes up his whole reports about the Middle East and is still on the active list, but doesn't have a command. And then in January 1943, he's put into command the uh, Indian Army's commander in chief and holds that position up to the end of the, the British Indian Army uh, in the tail end of 1947. Interestingly, in that second command period, there is no operational command. Uh, while Auchinleck is doing a lot in terms of recruitment and organising training regimes, officer appointments, all that sort of thing, the actual operational command uh, in the Far East at that stage is being given to Lord Mountbatten as Chief of, of CX Southeast Asia Command. So uh, it's, it's an unusual post in some ways then that it's shorn of, of all operational responsibilities. I said I would, I would mention a bit about the, the Ulster connections. Um, they're not perhaps as profound as some works would, would, would have them. Uh, Auchinleck is born in Aldershot. He is sent to prep schools in England, then Wellington College, then Sandhurst, and then the Indian Army. So there's no schooling in Ulster. Um, he doesn't speak with an Ulster accent. You can listen to some of the interviews uh, he gives later in life. And at the sort of the end of his career, he spends his retirement in England and then in Marrakesh. So it, it, there's no sort of return to Ulster there. But it's clear that Auchinleck spent most of his school holidays at uh, Cravena House near Oma in County Tyrone. And there's an interesting uh, snippet there. He visits the house in August 1946. And his private secretary, Shahid Hamid, recorded Auchinleck talking to the staff there saying, this is where I belong. And that is why I'm glad to be back here again to see you all. 
And of course, Auchinleck also takes over the honorary colonelcy of the Royal and Skill Fusiliers, which he holds from 1941 to 47, and talks at that point about his family's heritage and counties uh, Tyrone and Fermanagh. Uh, so you know, he clearly does identify uh, as an Ulsterman to some degree, but I think you know, Englishmen of that class, that age, often identified themselves as sort of subjects of the British Empire, first and foremost. I think the, the sort of regional identities that, that we would see as so important now uh, were not perhaps at the, the forefront uh, of their, their thoughts and identity. I'll talk now about the, the sort of nature of the, the Indian Army and its, its recruitment base uh, when Okanak is, is serving with it and how that, that changes. So we might just remind ourselves what we're talking about when we're talking about British India. It's now, uh, what, four or five successor states. Uh, so you're thinking of modern day India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma and Sri Lanka uh, being covered by, by British India. So a vast uh, area um, with, you know, a lot of, of geographical differences, religious differences, uh, different levels of industrialization, market economy, and so on. So a very um, disparate area to recruit from. And within this, you then have the, the concept of what's talked about as martial races. And I just put up uh, a selection of books there that you might uh, be interested in that, that, that look at this. Um, so essentially, the one of the great sort of imperial colonial constructs that the British military come up with is the idea that there are certain groups in India that are naturally warlike and are more dependable and reliable than others. Now, a lot of this goes back to the mutiny or rebellion, as it's more properly called now, of 1857-58, when those groups that remained loyal to the British are seen as martial races. So you're particularly thinking of their groups like Gurkhas and Sikhs. There's then some rather crude, uh, sort of pretty straightforward racist stuff about those that are from the North and are lighter skinned are more warlike because that of course means then that the British that are the most far to the North of any must be the most martial race. So these are the sorts of ideas you have there. And of course you get it in the British army as well. You get the idea of Highlanders as a, a martial race, even when uh, large chunks of the manpower in the Highland regiments are being recruited from uh, the East End of London or from the slums of Dublin. Uh, so you know, these are very odd ideas in some ways, but this is what the, um, Indian Army is, is based around for, for many years. So there is an idea that recruitment will, will target certain groups large in the north of India and will ignore groups elsewhere. Another factor to this is that it's often seen that groups that are from um, sort of agricultural backgrounds or from sort of hill tribes, hill areas, are the groups that they want to recruit because for a lot of the late 19th, early 20th century, a key role of the Indian Army is to act essentially as an imperial police force and to deal with strikes and political demonstrations in the big towns and cities. So the thought is if the recruiting bases for men from rural areas, then they're much less likely to be asked to uh, fire on uh, or arrest their, their relations. So there, there's, there's uh, that, that aspect uh, behind it as well. We can get an idea of how this works out over the period up to the First World War from this table. So you can see that, you know, to put it as, as crudely as we can, that basically those groups that are recruited from the north of India, so you've got the Punjab and Northwest Frontier province, uh, the best example, that the numbers recruited from there go up very largely, so they're seen as the most trusted martial races, whereas those from the southern parts of India, Bombay, Madras, the areas that have been most likely to rise up against the British, which were the most uh, sort of market economy, industrialised uh, areas, uh, that the numbers from there go down. And then, of course, within that, you can see how popular the Gurkhas become, that they start off with just five battalions in 1862, up to 20 by 1914. So that gives you some idea about how this uh, martial races idea uh, works out. 
Now, Oaken, like himself, enjoyed some aspects of the old martial races recruiting system when he was a uh, battalion adjutant in the period immediately before the First World War. He was responsible for recruiting for his own battalion, and that led him to visit a lot of the small villages where he got to know a lot of the village elders who were often army pensioners who would help to uh, recruit for the Indian Army. And that gave him a real sense of, of, sort of rural India and uh, Sort of traditions of it. Um, but what Auchinleck saw with others was that this recruiting system basically broke down with the demands of total war. So Auchinleck's own regiment, 62nd Punjabis, was a mixed regiment. So it brought together Sikh, Punjabi, and Rajput groups in separate companies. And this, again, is a sort of classic imperial idea of divide and rule, the idea that if one of these groups turned uh, against the British, the other two would remain loyal, that there would be some basis of loyalty, whatever happened. So the problems with all that, of course, is trying to recruit to replace uh, groups in that proportion and in that way when regiments were facing very heavy losses in the First World War, particularly on the Western Front. Uh, really saw this system break down. Um, David Omasi explores it in his book, uh, The Sepoy and the Raj, and says that the fiction that's carried on in the First World War is that the Indian government identifies 50 new martial races who are then recruited into the Indian army so that they maintain the idea that the martial races are still being tucked, but suddenly they find lots that they didn't even know were there. So that's, that's quite an odd approach and certainly not what's done in the, the Second World War. If we're thinking then about what Auchinleck's saying when he's commander in chief about the, the martial races and the need to, to move beyond this and recruit more broadly, um, I'll give you a, a quote from uh, a letter that he writes to Leo Amory, who was the Secretary of State for India. This in March 1941, when Auchinleck's serving his first period as commander in chief. And in that, Auchinleck says, as regards recruitment for the rank and file, I have no doubt at all that apart from any political considerations, we must broaden our basis. And this was already in hand before I arrived. I propose to continue and hasten the process. There is plenty of good untouched material which we can and should use. Politically too, it is, I think, essential to to meet to an appreciable extent the almost universal demand for general recruitment and to give the process proper publicity. This I hope to be able to do by reviving old units, such as the Madras Regiment, and raising new regular as opposed to territorial force units to represent provinces hitherto unrepresented, such as Bengal, Assam and Bihar. This can easily be done, as in some cases territorial units, which can be converted to regular units, already exist. I should say in that context that the territorial units he's talking about are the Indian Territorial Force, which had been raised in 1920, was about 20,000 strong on the outbreak of war and had a footprint in some areas where there weren't regular units. So the basis for these uh, units that he's talking about are basically asking men from the territorial force who were recruited for home service only if they would be prepared to serve overseas in general service and that then is the corridor for these new units to be uh, formed. So you might think so far so good. So what Auchinleck is talking about is more broad uh, recruitment and with the demands of, of total war, that seems perfectly sensible. But of course, one very important person in the British government isn't terribly keen on all this, and that, of course, is Winston Churchill. Churchill has a very old fashioned view of the Indian Army and thinks that it should really remain as a colonial force based around the martial races. And you'll probably be aware that Churchill's views of um, the need for Indian independence were deemed to be reactionary even in the Conservative Party of the 1930s. So most uh, British politicians are seeing uh, India as on the path to some sort of um, dominion status within the British Empire and that that's where they expect India to come at the end of the, the Second World War, whereas Churchill's view is that India should continue to be ruled effectively as a, a colony. Uh, so that, that creates problems there. Now, what Churchill is suggesting in June 1943 is that the Indian Army should be reduced in size and should return purely to the martial races recruitment. 
And in saying that, Churchill raised concerns about morale. He was concerned that a number of Indian prisoners of war had uh, effectively defected to the Japanese. So as prisoners of war, they had enlisted in the Indian National Army, which reaches a strength of about 50,000 strong. And he's also concerned that the um, Arakan Offensive in Burma hadn't gone particularly well. So that there are you know, some deep-seated concerns there. Um, but of course, and, and retorts to this, though not directly to Churchill himself, uh, Auchinleck does point out that it's these martial races that have been the groups that have been most likely to defect to the Indian National Army, that those that have enlisted from southern India that are, are more politically aware and politically active have in many cases enlisted from the point of view that they, they will help to secure dominion status for India at the end of the war and are in a, a sort of broad anti-Nazi, anti-Japanese militarist coalition. So uh, there's a little bit more uh, to, to be said about the politics of, of the Indian Army there, perhaps. In August 43, when Auchinleck is replying to, to Churchill's comments in a detailed uh, report, he says, mention must be made of the truly remarkable keenness to serve displayed by these new and hitherto untried classes. It is true that this may be due partly to economic reasons, but there is no doubt that it is also largely owing to a real desire to prove their worth as soldiers. Auchinleck at that point went on to say that uh, various classes who were not martial races were, were performing very well. He said that Madrasis and Bengalis were working very well in the technical branches, particularly the artillery and the signals. And I should, of course, say there that one of the legacies of the, the mutiny rebellion of 1857-58 was that there hadn't been a very large Indian artillery establishment uh, on the outbreak of war. It was a few mountain batteries and a handful of anti-aircraft guns. So the, the Indian artillery that's built up is built up effectively from these new groups without uh, much of a, a regular corridor. So it's seen the Madrasis and Bengalis have done particularly well there. Another group that he talks about are the Chimars, um, who are a low caste group. And he says that they have proved effective both in their own infantry regiment, but also in the Royal Indian Army Service Corps, where they have been very good working with animals, uh, because many of the Indian groups, because of the caste system, weren't prepared to work with animals and clean out animals effectively, mules, uh, horses and so on, whereas the tumors were happy enough to do that and were very effective at it. So uh, that gives you some idea about how the caste system still plays out in the Indian Army. Auchinleck goes on and sort of pushes things really to the nth with Churchill, which sees Churchill back down, where he says that if Churchill's desire is to reduce the Indian army, then really all that has to happen is that all the Indian units need to be recalled from the Middle East and from Italy so that the Indian army can perform properly against the Japanese in the Far East. Faced with that, Churchill decides to leave uh, well alone. So ultimately, you get the Indian army expanding to the strength of about two and a half million uh, personnel with some women uh, involved. If I can get my slides to move, um, I can show you that. So there we have a small group from the, the Women's Auxiliary Corps, something like 40,000 uh, women serve in the Indian Army, the equivalent to the ATS, which you might be familiar with uh, in the British Army, non-combatant roles uh, in India, largely clerical, um, but you know, it says something about the move towards a modern army that you do have uh, female involvement. This is a far cry from the, the martial races idea of the 1910s uh, and 20s. And the Indian Army then grows to be the largest volunteer army in world history uh, by the end of the Second World War. So that, that's important to say. But we perhaps shouldn't get too carried away. I'm not sure quite how clear this map is to you. But essentially, the martial races continue to dominate in the infantry. Um, so you'll get a sense here that Punjab is still accounting for a quarter of all Indian recruits. So this map is basically showing you that they're getting recruits from all over India, but it's still the, the sort of traditional martial races area that are providing a disproportionate amount. Um, I should say, of course, before we get too carried away, 
with the idea of this purely being some sort of colonial construct, that this is still the pattern you see in the modern Pakistan and Indian uh, armies, that the, these sort of so-called martial race groups of the, the old Raj still uh, dominate uh, in the, the, the modern uh, Pakistan and uh, Indian armies. So uh, that there is there is something about family traditions and so on to it, rather than just a, a colonial uh, mindset. Something I'll not say a great deal about, but probably the most famous of the martial races uh, and the one that you might think of first today um, are, of course, the Gurkhas uh, recruited from Nepal. And a lot of what Auchinleck is involved in between 1945 and 47 is trying to ensure that a number of Gurkha units will still be available for the British Army. And um, there's a complicated arrangement worked out with the Indian government where the Gurkhas are split between India and Britain. Uh, so there's about 10,000 uh, that come into uh, British service and that's still seen as an important imperial reserve uh, for uh, the garrison of Hong Kong for use of the Malayan emergency uh, to give two of the most obvious uh, examples. So there's a lot of concern about keeping um, the Gurkhas as some sort of imperial reserve, even when the rest of the, the British Indian Army uh, has, has gone. If I turn then to talk about the Indianization of the officer corps, this is something else that, that uh, you see great movement with uh, under Auchinleck as uh, commander in chief. In the 1920s, small numbers of Indian officers were sent to Sandhurst and there is an Indian military academy set up along the same lines as Sandhurst in the, the early 1930s. But these aren't terribly progressive things to be looking at. Some of the, the work that Indian historians have done in this have said that you know, had things sort of run their natural course without the Second World War getting in the way. At some point in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, the majority of Indian Army officers would have been Indian born rather than being white British officers. So this was something that was seen to be a process that would last for decades. All, all accelerated massively by the um, Second World War. The other thing that you see in the, the 1920s and 30s is a real concern that some Indian Army uh, battalions and cavalry regiments are going to emerge as what are called by Auchinleck and others, Jim Crow regiments. So there's a concern that these will be like the black um, regiments in the American Army, uh, in, in a strange sense, in that Indian officers will all be sent to this small number of regiments. And then because promotion is driven by seniority, uh, these will remain sort of all Indian officer units with no chance of promotion for many of the officers instead of them being spread throughout the army more broadly, where they would have a chance of progressing against each other, that effectively some Indian officers would end up blocking others' promotion uh, because of seniority. That was one of the real concerns uh, seen in the 20s and, and 30s. So what we have is, is some sort of modest moves towards getting Indians into the officer corps, but nothing very um, profound before uh, the Second World War. Auchinleck is very much in favour of Indianization of the, the officer corps. He thinks that Indian officers can perform perfectly well. Um, there's also, frankly, of course, a sense of desperation that there aren't really that many other options. The, the British Army proper is having enough trouble trying to get officers in the uh, Second World War, let alone trying to find massive contingents to send out to uh, India. Um, and as early as March 1941, Auchinleck was making the case that Indian-born officers had to be paid exactly the same as white British officers, otherwise morale would slump and the system wouldn't uh, work out. The problem that Auchinleck sees more profoundly in August 1943, though, isn't to do with officers. He thinks that the Indian um, Sort of middle classes are providing a fair number of officers, but his real concern there, as is always the case with the, the British Army, is where to get non-commissioned officers from, and also what were called viceroys, commissioned officers in the Indian Army, which are the equivalent of warrant officers, uh, really in the British Army. So there was great concern where they could get these sorts of uh, men from, particularly for these newly raised units. So that's 
almost more of a concern than where to get uh, officers from. In August 1946, Auchinleck addressed the officers at the Staff College in Quetta and stated that British officers would remain in senior and middle ranks for many years to come until they could be replaced by Indians. And of course, we should remember that the move to Indian and Pakistan independence moves very, very quickly uh, towards the end. You know, there's an idea in sort of 45, 46, that this is going to be quite a long drawn out process, um, as to some degree it was with uh, some of the African states, uh, but suddenly things move very quickly. So, so August 46, there's an idea that you'll have British Army officers as majors, lieutenant colonels, brigadiers, major generals, lieutenant generals, all that, long into the 1950s until Indian Pakistan officers are seen to have enough seniority to take on those roles. In March 1947, Auchinleck sort of shows you the, the sort of dilemmas of the system where he says that there are 8,500 Indian officers serving in the Indian Army, by which he means Indian and wants to become a Pakistan Army as well, along with 13,500 white British officers. And he then says that 8,500 officers is the number that was needed for a peacetime establishment of 220,000 other ranks. So the numbers sort of work out. But what Auchinleck goes on to say is that if the Indian-born officers. Only 500 had gained their commissions before the war, uh, so it was only 500 that had more than seven years service. And he goes on to say that you know, Lieutenant Colonel of the British Army would have 20 years service in peacetime, so he thinks that that's, that's the main problem. And then he goes on to say that there are two and a half thousand British officers in the technical arms, and it was very unclear how they could be replaced. But to show you how quickly things are moving, he also reflects in March 1947 that uh, the complete Indianization of the Indian Army by mid-1948 is sort of impossible if efficiency was to be retained, but then goes on to say that if India leaves the Commonwealth, which looks to be the case, and is of course what happens, then you can hardly have British Army officers left attached to the Indian Army. Uh, so that sort of shows you the, the dilemma that, that uh, is, is very obvious by that point, that experienced British officers can't really stay on uh, in the Indian Army, and it's not clear how uh, the Indian Pakistan armies can, can develop. The Pakistan Army is, is keener to keep on some experienced British officers than the Indian uh, Army is, and Indian politicians are, but uh, it's still not uh, the sort of numbers that Auchinleck thought were needed. I'll turn now to ideas of the Indian Army and what we might think of as a, an imperial reserve. And I'll put up uh, illustrations of a few books you might find interesting uh, considering the Indian Army in the uh, Second World War. Now, if we're, we're starting off thinking about the, the First World War, the Kitchener reforms, uh, yes, that Lord Kitchener, when he was out as Commander-in-Chief in India uh, of 1904-1907, they transform the Indian Army from what we might see as a colonial police force, widely dispersed, largely there to deal with riding disturbances in towns and so on, into a field army with an expeditionary capability. So in the outbreak of war in 1914, um, as I've mentioned briefly already, two Indian infantry divisions and an Indian cavalry division are sent to the Western Front. Um, some of the audience you know, will hopefully have been out to and seen New Chapelle Memorial, which gives you a good flavour of that, or indeed the names on the men and gate from the Indian uh, regiments, which are, are well worth a look. There's then also a brigade that's sent to uh, deal with German East Africa, and there's another brigade sent to the Persian Gulf. So in the outbreak of war, these are quite significant forces that India is in a position to send overseas. And indeed, by the end of the First World War, the bulk of the British imperial forces in the Middle East are Indian. And indeed, members of this audience, I'm sure, will know that the 10th Irish Division is Indianised in 1918, which meant that nine of its Irish battalions were sent to the Western Front as reinforcements and their place taken with Indian uh, battalions. The situation had changed quite a bit by the 
Second World War, as, as of course it had for the British Army itself, you know, for thinking about the British Army proper, uh, in August 1914, they're able to send six infantry divisions and one cavalry division to France. In September 1939, they're able to send four divisions to France. Uh, so that gives you an idea of, of sort of expeditionary capability for the, for the British Army. For the Indian Army, uh, there had been ideas very late on in the 1930s about how it would be recast and reformed. And uh, there's what's called the Chatfield Commission that meets uh, to consider uh, the Indian Army and its future development. And they take a lot of evidence from Auchinleck and the suggestion is that Auchinleck's report for the Indian Army is largely incorporated in the Chatfield Commission report. Now, what they actually suggest is that the Indian Army should be reduced in numbers and that the money saved from paying those soldiers would be used to create a number of armoured car regiments. So a number of Indian cavalry regiments were converted over to be armoured car. And the thought then was that a brigade of armoured cars could deal with anything that um, would come out of Afghanistan. Some might say that that's uh, something that's been revisited fairly recently. The idea that very lightly armed forces could do a lot in Afghanistan. Uh, beyond that, then, there was a view that there would be about three or four Indian infantry brigades that could be sent outside India in the event of war, but really as garrison forces and secondary theatres. Um, not, not much more than that really seems to have been considered uh, as late as sort of 30, early 39. We see some echoes of that in that the Indian Army Force sent to join the British Expeditionary Force in France in 1939-1940 is to mule transport companies, so a, a far cry from the two infantry divisions and one cavalry division that were sent uh, in 1914. But then, of course, we should reflect that the 4th and 5th Indian divisions are sent to the Middle East uh, fairly sharply, and indeed the um, 4th Indian division takes part in Wavell's offensive against the Italians in the summer of 1940 in the Western Desert uh, campaign to, to very good effect. So, uh, sort of battle-hardened Indian units are in action comparatively early on in the uh, Second World War. But expansion then is problematic. There'd be no ground plans laid for this uh, in 1938-39. So Auchinleck is very much in the back foot when he is dealing with expansion plans in 1941 as commander in chief. Um, what he's saying then is that he's convinced that large numbers of personnel could be recruited, but the equipment for them would be lacking. So he's very concerned that he would get large numbers of men in who then would be training with dummy weapons. He doesn't think that's a terribly good idea. And to give you an idea of how um, poor the equipment is for the Indian Army as you get into 1941, I can give you two examples. When an Indian Army contingent is sent to Iraq in 1941 to forestall a pro-German coup, they are sent with armoured cars that are of 1926 vintage that had been... Um, repurposed by having their chassis replaced with Ford uh, truck chassis. Um, but these are, are you know, old, old armoured cars uh, by any stretch of the imagination. When the 18th Indian Division was sent to Singapore in 1941, the 18th Indian Division is the number possibly suggests to you, a wartime raised um, division. Their sole anti-tank equipment were Austrian anti-tank rifles of 1917 vintage. These had been captured by the Italians in 1918 and then captured from the Italian army by the British and Indian forces in the Western Desert in 1940 and then sent out to India. This is not cutting edge technology. There are also those hangovers uh, that I've mentioned already that you had very little Indian artillery in 1939, so expanding that is, is difficult. They do end up with a very considerable uh, artillery component, but there, there's a very thin corridor uh, for that. And there was also the concept uh, as late as 1941 that every Indian brigade needed to have one British battalion 
in it, the idea that if all else fell apart, there would be this reliable British battalion. Um, that, of course, is very much derided by Auchinleck and also by Leo Emery, the um, Secretary of State for India, who say that you can't reduce Indian expansion because you can't get enough troops from Britain uh, to make this process work. And of course, the divisions that uh, perform so well in Burma in 1944-45 are, are all Indian formations in, in many cases. Having said all that, Auchinleck's expansion plans for 1942, which is what he's putting in place in 1941, saw another five Indian Army divisions available for overseas service. And the fact that there were no aircraft, no gliders and no parachutes didn't prevent Claude Auchinleck uh, forming a parachute brigade uh, for the Indian Army, which, which does actually perform as, as a parachute brigade uh, later on in the war to do with the capture of uh, Rangoon. So if we think about you know, how this all works out in the end, uh, we can say that by 1945, the Indian Army had taken on not just the bulk of the fighting in Burma, but had provided large forces to serve in the Middle East and then in the Italian campaign. Uh, Indian artillery regiments had been formed and cavalry regiments successfully converted to tank units. And Alan Jeffrey's book here uh, credits Auchinleck with a lot of this in terms of the training provided to the Indian Army. And indeed, Indian Army recruits were being put through their basic training and then a, a, a difficult four month jungle warfare training course. And that was seen to be very much prized over the fairly shambolic training that some British reinforcements were receiving before they were sent out to the Far East. Indeed, there were some stories that came to Auchinleck's attention of British soldiers being packed off to um, India with the view that they could very quickly be sent to Burma when they'd never actually fired a rifle. Um, so he thinks they need considerable amounts of retraining before they can be uh, sent on. If I turn then for the final part of today's talk to say a little bit about the, the partition of India and the Indian Army. As early as August 1945, Auchinleck had come to the conclusion that British troops could not be used to quell civil disturbances in India unless an autonomous Indian or Pakistan government asked for them to be used. In November 1945, he gave his view that the Indian Army would be able to deal with communal tension with the risk of only a few isolated breakdowns. But of course, you'll be aware that the partition of India, Pakistan is a very, very bloody affair. Um, something like one and a half million people killed. Um, those that are in, in off the entire train loads of refugees that, that are massacred. And in the face of all that, uh, I think that Auchinleck's concern is that the Indian Army, if it's pushed too hard, will then crack in the same way that sort of India Pakistan society had cracked. So there are some examples of units which claimed uh, one of the Sikh uh, battalions, for example, their commanding officer claims that they had escorted 40 trains without incident. Um, but there are other areas where units are, are effectively con confined to barracks, the thought being that they would, would split apart. In September 47, Auchinleck was very concerned about communal tensions and partition ideas infecting the army. The grand idea that had been talked about in late 46 and in early 47 was that Auchinleck would continue as a commander in chief over the Pakistan and Indian government forces the idea that these would still be dominions and that he would then have a watching brief over the whole lot and of course one of the ideas behind that was that it would be much cheaper to have one staff college one cadet college one type of training school for signalers than to have two uh one in pakistan one in india uh, but it's clear in September 47 that they can't push ahead with those ideas. It's clear that all these training uh, establishments effectively have to be split in two and that uh, there has to be segregated training of, of new personnel. To give you an idea of the situation uh, later in September 1947, this is, is probably where I'll end uh, today, uh, Auchinleck reflects on how much things have changed by then saying, 
Before the transfer of power on the 15th of August, the representatives of the new India Four Board to show their hand and display generally a spirit of reasonableness and an apparent desire to cooperate. The meetings of the Armed Forces Reconstitution Committee were conducted in the encouraging spirit of cooperation and of give and take. I should say there that the Armed Forces Reconstitution Committee was thought to be a nicer term than the Armed Forces Partition Committee, which is, is what it was really there to do. Auchinleck then goes on to say, since the 15th of August, however, the situation has steadily deteriorated and the Indian leaders, cabinet ministers, civil officials and others have persistently tried to obstruct the work of partition of the armed forces. I and my officers have been continuously and virulently accused of being pro-Pakistan and partial, whereas the truth is that we have merely tried to do our duty impartially and without fear, favour or affection that we have done this universally acknowledged by all fair-minded people. This campaign continues and grows stronger and more vicious by the day. The Governor-General, Lord Mountbatten, is subjected to strong and unceasing pressure to abolish my headquarters so that the one impartial body remaining in this country shall be removed. Um, there are other uh, letters to Auchinleck Lack about battalion commanders where they talk of the old soldiers in tears as uh, regiments are broken up and some of these uh, regiments that took companies of different creeds, classes, are sending some of their companies away and bringing companies from other regiments and this is ripping up old uh, you know, comradeship from the, from the Second World War. It's said that at the end of all this that Auchinleck um, Feels very much sidelined, and there is certainly a campaign against him in the Indian press, uh, which sort of says that his headquarters is pointless and needs to be disbanded uh, as quickly as possible. And Auchinleck seems to have thought that this was a very rushed process in the end. One of the reasons, apparently, that he didn't take uh, a peerage, um, although there are other reasons for that, I think some of them uh, financial. Uh, so, you know, ultimately, uh, Auchinleck gets credit for handing over um, two foreign military establishments to two new governments, but he's hardly happy with the situation it leaves him in, and it's a very sad end to his career. And it says something, of course, that at the end of it all, he decides to retire in Marrakesh because he can't really stand the climate of England, have, having lived overseas for so long, um, but he feels that he can't really in all conscience settle in either India or Pakistan, given uh, how partition uh, was carried out and how the army that he had served in for so many years had, had been fractured. I'll end it there then. Thanks very much and invite your questions. Hopefully some people have been typing away while I've been uh, speaking.